at the back. Awesome. So welcome to the museum. My name is Leanne. I'm a chemistry instructor at the University of Waterloo. I've been coming at the museum for a little bit of a while. I first moved into the region in 2017, and I've been coming every now and then since. Obviously, there's been a lull in the last little while. Not going to talk about it, but it's very exciting to be back. This is the kind of stuff I love the most. I absolutely love teaching my students more advanced chemical concepts, but playing around with uh, solutions and showing the general public what chemistry can do in your daily life is my favorite thing. So today I have a theme. I, I always try to use a different theme every time. So when I was first asked to do a show, I was like, oh, let's do a general title. Let's call it Chemistry is Elemental because I like to showcase the various elements of the periodic table. Everyone, anyone knows how many elements of the periodic table we have? Ballpark, who's voting for 50? Who's voting for 70? Who's voting for 100? Yeah, 118, so lots of elements. Obviously, don't have time to do 118 experiments. I wish. Um, but more specifically, my theme today is about the new language we've learned in the last 18 months. I'd like to see more scientific programming on TV, so tuning into the news and hearing a lot about science statistics and the advances in technology we've made in the last 18 months has been really exciting and fun for me. Probably one of the rare ones out there who's really excited when I hear like coronavirus or SARS-CoV-19 and things like polymerase chain reaction, that terrible up the nose test some of you may have had to take. And also uh, a word that I like is aerosol because aerosols are a, almost like a state of the matter in themselves. They have very different properties. And I thought I'd start off the show by demonstrating just that. So aerosols, anyone know the definition? Yeah, you know? It's when you, like when you sneeze, right? So sneeze is liquid in gas. So an aerosol, um, I don't have the definition here, I think. Um, aerosol is any mixture of either a solid or a liquid in a gas. So here in my uh, weighing dish, I have cornstarch. And I thought I would show you kind of how it reacts if I try to burn it. It doesn't really burn. It will singe a little bit, but you know, trying to burn cornstarch doesn't really work. Anyone has heard of a silo explosion? Yes. What, how does a silo explosion happen? Do you know? Exactly. Any dust, any grain inside the silo cavity mixes with air, creates a solid in air aerosol. And now that's flammable. So. How about I demonstrate just that? Oh. Usually I expect a reaction when I breathe fire, but you know, I'm I'm sure you've seen a lot of cool stuff in the last little while, but you know, maybe the next one will do it for you. All right, so let's see if we can learn some new words today. So how many words do you think I can teach you today? I, I think I got about 10 or so words. Some are more wild than others, and hopefully uh, how I decide to demonstrate for you uh, will surprise you. So the first word is a very common word in chemistry, catalyst. A catalyst is a substance that makes a reaction go faster. So in my two flasks, I have hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide, you've probably used it to clean a wound, so it's a good antiseptic. The reason for that is when it's exposed to blood, it will generate oxygen, and oxygen will clean your wounds. So I have catalyst in here. I use Ki because it's really efficient. So we'll also play on solid versus liquid phase. So um, I'll have you choose some colors. So someone name their favorite color. Yeah, at the front, blue, I heard blue. You can scream it out. Pink, awesome. So we're gonna do blue versus pink. And I'll try to time myself. I'm not very good. I'm a 
It's purple. I hope you can accept that as a pink substitute. So solid is blue. Liquid is purple or pink. Who votes that the solid is going to be a bigger reaction? You do? That's, and you do as well? Who thinks that the liquid will be a bigger reaction? You do? You do? So a few more votes for liquid, but it's kind of half and half. So, so let's just see. No, I kind of saw this one. Liquid a little bit better. So what happens is when I put my catalyst, it speeds up the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide, and I put uh, some soap, and so the soap traps the oxygen that's generated, and we get a nice bubbly explosion. So that, that was more fun than a breathing fire. All right, I get it. So another word you may encounter a lot in chemistry is pH, hydrogen potential. So pH, um, anyone that has a pool at home? Can I come later? It's really hot. <laughs> so if you have a pool at home, you may be testing the pH. And pH is super important in a lot of application. So here I have um, a solution filled with a little bit of base. I use potassium carbonate. And if I put in dry ice into it, so it bubbles because the dry ice is roughly minus 78 degrees Celsius. And uh, dry ice is made out of solid, solid carbon dioxide. So as it goes into solution, and hopefully it goes sooner rather than later, I'll let it go. But as it goes into solution, it will acidify our solution and it will change color. Another way I can cause a color change is with just my breath, right? We breathe out CO2. So I have another solution. I'll dilute it a little bit if I have some water. Because your blood and all biological systems are highly regulated in terms of pH. So, oh, you see the color starting to change, right? It's blue at the top. I have time. I'll try to erase it. So here I have a different indicator. It's called phenolphthalein. This is a universal indicator that go goes through all the colors. But you see now the color's gone, right? Because just with the CO2 from my breath, I was able to neutralize any trace of base that was inside the solution, right? So we'll leave it going. Uh, you might see it go from, now it's blue, it go to green, yellow, and then hopefully red at some point. It's nice, it has a nice color gradient. We love that. Awesome. What is, whoops, that we did already. Another reaction uh, type that we have in chemistry that you might hear a lot is redox. And redox is kind of a compound word. It's for reduction and oxidation. So these types of reactions are very common. They happen even in your body. And they involve the exchange of electrons. So if we remember our uh, atom model, electrons are kind of on the outsides of atoms. So depending on their properties, they can trade those. So I have um, a reaction demonstrating that. I have two, actually. Um, so the first one is a really classic demonstration, but apparently I'm really bad at either doing math or uh, preparing solutions. I tested it out this morning, and I wasn't able to get it to really do a clock like it's supposed to do, but it still changes color. So what happens is when I combine the two solutions, they will react together to form triiodide or iodine uh, in tree solution. And I have some starch inside that will turn the solution blue, but I think I overshot it. So it becomes orange like this. It's supposed to go back between clear and either orange or blue and then back to clear. This morning when I tested it out, it wasn't turning around, but we'll let, let it go and see what it does. I have another example. So I was telling you that redox reactions were super common in biological systems. And sugars are a very common um, compound that undergo redox reaction. So in this column, I have a purple-ish reagent, not the same as the purple from this one. Inside of this is potassium permanganate. 
Potassium permanganate is used in, um, to clean water because it can oxidize a bunch of um, any kind of biological traces, including sugar. So I made a sugar solution, so regular table sugar with some sodium hydroxide to provide the correct reaction conditions. And when I combine the two together, I'll try to do it like I'm pouring a mixed drink, but um, that, that ain't my trade. So what I'm hoping to see is a nice color gradient. Right? So as the reaction happens, and it happened kind of quick, um, so the solution was initially purple because of the manganese uh, ions. And as the reaction happens, then there's an uh, exchange of electron between manganese and the sugar, and manganese changes oxidation state and becomes this orange color. Okay. So we talked a little bit about the periodic table and that they have very different properties. And we have a lot of elements. So have you ever wondered how a chemist would identify what elements are in its a sample that they're trying to identify. For example, in geology, you were often interested in knowing what's inside the rock, like what kind of elements are inside the rock. Have you wondered how we do that? Yeah, so a very classic method that we use is called the flame test. So if you look at the periodic table, you see it's arranged by lines and also by columns. So each column represents a particular arrangement of electrons inside of our atom. And even if you look at uh, a particular column, it's like a family, it's like a family tree, each column. So elements that are together in a column would have similar-ish property and similar-ish um, colors when you do the flame test. And by looking at the color in a very precise way, you can know um, what element you have inside your sample. Even if they're mixed, because the energy is so specific, then you know what kind of the fingerprint of your element is. And we call this electron configuration, okay? So I can demonstrate that. I don't know if the museum staff is able to dim the lights for me. I didn't ask them beforehand, so that's on me. But we'll, we'll oh, thank you. So we'll be able to see it. Who in the audience is a Harry Potter fan? Oh yeah, Harry Potter fan. Do you know which, which house you're in? Hufflepuff, yeah, I love Hufflepuff. I think it's like really um, kind of understated as a, as a house. So I have my, my Hufflepuff solution here, if I can manage to spray it. Oh my goodness. I tested this this morning as I was looking, but obviously when you have an audience, the pressure is on for Hufflepuff. All right, let's see if I can burn it out in a different way. I want to do it safely, of course. Um, let me try to find either like a little piece of wood or something. I'll do something really technologically advanced and use a piece of paper and dip it into my solution, we'll still be able to detect our element in there. Ooh. So this was sodium. I'll snuff it. So sodium burns with a yellow flame. Works nicer if uh, I can spray it. So let's see, who do I have next? Slytherin. Let's see if my Slytherin solution is spraying a bit better. Nicer spray. Ooh, ooh, ooh. So Slytherin, I put boron in there. It's kind of hard to see. My boron solution is a bit weak, apparently. So it sh should be a bright green solution. Let's see if our next one is the best. So you know, Gryffindor always show off. My, red, my, my Gryffindor solution usually tends to be quite nice. If I could spray it. Friend. Sounds like at the intermission, I'll run to the dollar store, get a new spray bottle for these guys. It's very exciting, waiting for the spray bottle to work. So I'll, I'll, I'll use my, my other technologically advanced little paper 
solution and try not to burn myself. So Gryffindor likes to be a show off, so nice red flames. And finally, so personally I'm a Ravenclaw because you know, big nerds in the house. Ravenclaw is a hard solution to make. So uh, do you like going to fireworks show? Yeah, have you noticed how blue fireworks are kind of rare? It's because they're hard to make. So I, I, I did a mix with potassium and copper to try and get a Ravenclaw solution. But I think it's gonna air more green because that's how she goes apparently. Come on, baby. Yeah, looks like we're getting a, a do over of the Slytherin, if I can just spray it correctly. All right, well, that was very underwhelming fireworks. This is why they don't hire me at Waterloo Parks to do the fireworks, and that ain't my trade. But let's see if I can redeem myself with another kind of Harry Potter themed um, show. And then I can just skip my slide to go. Apparently that's not working either. So this is probably the weirdest word that I have included in my presentation. Alotrope. Anyone heard that word before? Maybe the older crowd, the parent crowd. So alotrope is a different a physical form that an element can, can take. Good example, graphite versus diamond. Both of these are carbon, right? But your lead pencil, that's actually a graphite pencil, doesn't cost quite as much as a diamond ring, right? Because there's a value in each allotrope of, um, of an element. So here I have a demonstration and I had to kind of tweak it a little bit. So normally I fill this flask with oxygen gas. However, supply chain demands have mean, meant that oxygen goes elsewhere than at the university. So I had to improvise. So what I actually thought yesterday, I was like, okay, use my chemist brain. So I thought of the elephant toothpaste that I generate oxygen. I was like, oh, let's put a little bit of hydrogen peroxide, a little bit of Ki. It will do oxygen and uh, water vapor inside my flask. That should provide the correct environment for this next demonstration. So this next demonstration, I call it the phosphorus sun or you could call it also the, the Philosopher's Stone, right? So if you've read the first Harry Potter, that was something they were interested in. So historically, the Philosopher's Stone was uh, a thing of interest for alchemists. And I love alchemy because I like old school things. Um, so this German chemist called Henning Brand was trying to make the Philosopher's Stone. Anyone remember what um, alchemists were trying to do with the Philosopher's Stone. They were like Voldemort trying to use it to rejuvenate themselves. So they wanted to use it to turn uh, basic metals like mercury and lead into gold. So Henning Brand with his chemist brain, he was like, okay, so I want to make gold, so I need something yellow to make my Philosopher's Stone. What do I have a lot of that is yellow? Anyone has an idea? Sulfur, not quite, they knew about sulfur at that time, but he was even weirder ideas than that. He was like, I will use my urine. And so he took vats and vats of his urine and concentrated it into a paste that he then burnt. I don't even want to think about how bad the smell in his lab. And what it was actually phosphorus. So here I have red phosphorus that is, um, normally you have a little bit of that on top of um, your matches. So red phosphorus is less toxic and less flammable than its cousin white phosphorus, but it still works. So I'm hoping that even though I generated a lot of water, I can still make this guy burn. All right. Oh, she burning. And then usually when I have enough oxygen, it ends up lighting the whole flask. It's, it's going, it's going, it's not too bad. So when Henning Brand saw that result of his experiment, he was like, I did it. Up when he treated um, the metals with phosphorus, he saw that it wasn't quite exactly what he wanted because he wasn't able to turn them into gold. 
Later on, they also discovered that, you know, that's not how you make gold. Gold is its own element, so you can't transmute it unless you're using radioactive uh, processing. All right. So we've seen um, reactions that burn and generate light, but there's also a reaction that don't generate any heat and that also generate light. Maybe at Halloween time, you take advantage of such properties. Um, anyone like playing with glow sticks? Yeah, awesome. Glow sticks are super fun. And the way glow sticks work, it's kind of a throwback to another word we learned, redox. So in certain cases, when you have a redox reaction happening, you end up with a compound in an excited state. And uh, when, an, when an element or a uh, molecule is in its excited state, it doesn't just go woohoo. Sometimes it also generates photons, and photons are kind of light particles, right? And so this is what I'm going to show here, if I can show this guy. So thankfully, I have some stories to tell you while I'm setting up my apparatus. If I can ask the kind museum staff to dim the lights again, you can see her better. So in this ocean that is, um, that is blue in color, I have a compound called luminol. Uh, you may have heard of luminol in TV. Uh, it's used to spray on um, biological stains to see if there was blood or any kind of biological fluid. And it's because inside the fluid, there could be oxidizing species. So that's what I have in my mixture here. So when I combine the two together, might not see it quite. Oh. Do it again. get some color out of it. Better when we're in fully in the dark, I suppose so. Let's show her again, I have lots of solution. So you can see the difference. So I have a little bit of blue, but you can see in the spiral that when I add the oxidizing species, it's a lot brighter. Show her again. It's better, you have to really time your rate. Oh, oh, oh. Ah, there we go. Nice blue color. Oh, brighty. And now, the last word, probably the less exciting of them, but hopefully my way of demonstrating is, is exciting. Uh, although, you know, with the fire breathing incident, not sure what this crowd likes. So we'll see if you like this one. Um, it's one of my favorite demonstrations because also I'm feeling quite warm right now, not just from uh, the, the heat outside, but just from presenting. I'll try to make myself some room in here. So inside my very vintage looking doer, it probably comes from alchemy time. <laughs> Promise I never peed in it. Um, I had liquid nitrogen. So liquid nitrogen is a very, very cold liquid around minus 196 degrees Celsius, right? So what will I do with this liquid nitrogen? So have you ever thought of, th of what the recipe of a cloud would be? What goes into a cloud? So you need water, right? And the other ingredient people don't think about is you need a temperature different. You need condition difference. If it's a nice, clear day, you don't get clouds. But if there's temperature in, uh, differences or pressure differences in the atmosphere, that's when you get a cloud. So I have my very, very cold liquid nitrogen. And I have, hopefully, rolly boiling at this point, try not to go uh, knock down my computer. So I have hot water, right? And so the temperature difference now is between minus 200 and plus 100. So a nice 300 degrees difference. Let's mix the two together and see what happens. And that's the cloud, my friends. 
And now you see why I use the more boring word at the very end. It's quite of a splashy demonstration. I want to thank you so much for taking the time and doing something educational today. I hope you enjoyed the museum. And please be very nice to the museum staff. They worked really hard to allow us this experience today. So thank you very much.